Greetings, this is J.R. Dickey. Thanks for tuning in to our podcast. And by the way, don't forget our website, graceandtruth.net. I hope you're having a great day, but if not, hang with me. It's about to get better. Okay, today we're going to talk about something really beautiful. Let's get started. I was a goner. All it took was one look and whammo. Yep, when I first met my wife... I was instantly attracted to her. We won't get into what she first thought about me. Uh, And it was a unique attraction. She wasn't and isn't just pretty. She seemed to me to be glowing, radiant in beauty. Her voice was like a song, and her eyes were like deep, mysterious pools. She danced as she walked. Forty-five minutes later, I kid you not, I asked her to marry me. That was 49 years ago. And what does that have to do with holiness? A lot. Hang with me and you'll see what I mean. Holiness is from the Hebrew word pronounced kadash. Hope I said that right, my Jewish friends. And it means to be separate, set apart and sacred. Importantly, it is derived from the word meaning to be or to make clean. Thus, it's far more than simply a separateness. It points to a quality or essence of being that is absolutely without imperfection, without the slightest hint of impurity. But this definition itself is a mere shadow of the reality and a fuzzy one at best. Let's search the scriptures to better understand it. Revelations 15.4, it says, Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. God alone is holy in and of himself. Now, 70 people, places, or items are declared in the Bible to be holy, but anyone or anything in Scripture that is declared truthfully to be so derives that attribute solely because of a relationship with God Almighty. Scripture clearly portrays that although there is a binary status, if you would, with holiness, either someone or something is or isn't, uh, you can check out Leviticus 10.10 as an example there. There are also degrees of holiness, and this is pictured quite clearly in the design of the tabernacle. That was a big tent where they all worshipped, and later the temple. While in the wilderness, the congregation of Israel camped outside the tabernacle. Within the outer court of the tabernacle came those seeking to worship. Within this court was the holy place in which the priests alone ministered. Then, within the holy place was the holy of holies, into which the high priest alone could enter and that only once per year. So as you can see, there is portrayed in its design a greater and greater association with holiness moving from the camp to the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place, that is, in the presence of God. At this point, though, The holiness curve takes an asymptotic turn and shoots right off the graph, so to speak. Let me explain. Occasionally, we'll find double declarations in the original languages for emphasis, such as peace, peace in Isaiah 26.3, or grace, grace in Zechariah 4.7, or truly, truly in John 1.51 and other places. But there is only one triple declaration in all of Scripture. It pertains to God, and it is in Isaiah 6.3 and Revelations 4.8, and it is holy, holy, holy. You see, God's holiness isn't just perfect. It's in a class all by itself. And so, conceptually, or pictorially, within the congregation of believers, that would be the camp, is found the holy place of worship, the court, within which is found the even more holy place of ministry to God, that is, the holy place, within which is found the intimate place of one-on-one fellowship, 
that is, the Holy of Holies, with the only one who is, get this, holy, holy, holy. God's holiness, A.W. Tozer wrote, is not simply the best we know, infinitely bettered. We know nothing like the divine holiness. It stands apart, unique, unapproachable, incomprehensible, unattainable. The natural man is blind to it. He may fear God's power and admire his wisdom, but holiness he cannot even imagine. Now, this fundamental point must be accepted and underscored. God alone is holy in and of himself. Nothing, no one, no place is holy apart from its connection to God's presence, his spirit. If you don't hold to that, your understanding of holiness will be superstitious and misled. Now, here's a stunning and breathtaking truth. Get ready? God, contrary to what Satan suggested in the Garden of Eden, wants you to be a partaker of his holiness. Check out 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. This does not imply hair buns or black hats. Now, I'm not knocking those expressions. You simply cannot equate them with the divine holiness. When you catch your breath, consider how significant this is. God wants you to share in the characteristic which mesmerizes the highest of his created beings. Revelations 4.8 The four living creatures, having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. You see... God calls his people a holy people and a holy nation. And this serves at least three great purposes. Simply, one, to testify to the world. Two, to bless and protect us individually. And three, most importantly, to bless God. First, set apart and clean from the world, we are to be a visual display of what our Lord and his heavenly home are like in character. Thus, when the church becomes indistinguishable from the world, it is failing. When we are consumed with self-gratification, we only betray the gospel no matter what t-shirts we wear, which church we attend, or which ministries we pursue. Now, being distinguishable from the world doesn't necessarily mean being weird. Though the only man in the Bible, apart from Christ, who is specifically named as holy, was clothed in camel's hair and ate bugs. That was John the Baptist. Holiness may seem strange to the world of the spiritually blind, but it's not because of our trying to appear outrageous. I was recently told by a pastor in France that a widespread perception of the evangelical church there is as a bunch of crazies looking for a comet to be beamed up to. That's clearly a misrepresentation, and it's certainly not the distinguished ability of holiness. But the world, when it sees true holiness, is utterly convicted, and it reacts by either accepting or rejecting it. Secondly, in partaking of God's holiness, we remain salty, if you would. That is, the continual work of His Spirit in separating us and cleansing our hearts creates an inward condition that is suited to spiritual growth like a weed-free garden. In addition, it frustrates and defuses the attempts of the enemies of our souls, that is the devil, the fallen world, and our own sin nature, to seduce, intimidate, or otherwise extinguish our distinguishability. Thirdly, it just amazes me that God would actually enjoy my fellowship. Hey, you don't need to grieve so quickly, but He does. Yours too. He wants us to see him and know him as he is. But it's not a casual deal. The Bible tells us, quote, to pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. That's Hebrews 12, 14. That word pursue 
is actually a very aggressive word, meaning to chase down in an almost violent manner, to run swiftly in order to catch a person or thing. You see, if it was solely a matter of being saved and thus being holy, we would have no command to chase it. However, in partaking of His holiness to greater and greater degrees, the Lord becomes more visible, if you would, to us and in us, and thus more impressive. As with the tabernacle illustration, the closer we progress from the camp toward the one who is holy, 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 the more intimate our fellowship with him will be. When the temple veil before the Holy of Holies was torn apart from top to bottom at the end of Christ's crucifixion, God was saying that the way into his presence is now open. The entire way, all because of Jesus. He wants you in his presence. So, practically, how does this happen? What is this pursuit, this swift running after holiness? Is it the result of how intense you appear spiritually or some secret, deeper truths? Or the result of going to the right conferences? (laughs) No. By accepting the gracious gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, you become one of God's children, adopted into his family, and therefore, by association with the only one who is holy, you are a partaker of his holiness. However, there is this issue of pursuit. It's not an issue of salvation, no addition whatsoever to the finished work of the cross. It is rather a matter of response. Hosea 6.3 says, Let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. A careful word study reveals that of the 669 mentions of the word holy or holiness by the 40 men used by the Holy Spirit to pen those scriptures, nearly two-thirds of the mentions come from just five of the 40 authors. Five of these guys seem to really be into the Lord's holiness. They are Moses, Isaiah, Ezekiel, John, and Paul. Why, I wonder. Each of these men witnessed the awesome glory of the Lord. You can see Exodus 34, Isaiah 6, Ezekiel 1, Revelation 1, and Acts 9 for reference. They had personal encounters with our holy God, and it clearly impacted their appreciation of the holy. Based upon their testimonies, it's obvious that once you've witnessed it, true holiness is simply not something you can be casual about. As you draw nearer to the Lord, pursuit of personal holiness becomes a priority along with your appreciation of the divine. Yet personal holiness does not and will not come from works. We must not confuse holy conduct with holiness itself. You see, the latter results in the former and not the other way around. Paul wrote, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. Unfortunately, We can miss that this word be, as in be holy, is actually become. It is a particular action without regard for beginning or ending. We are to become holy in our conduct. Now, how does that work? In four ways. Bear with me. First, when we put our focus on this world, it's hard not to be conformed to the world. We can still fall prey to the lust that enslaved us while we were ignorant of the devil's deception. We need to look ahead toward the grace that is being stored up for us. If our hope is in this life, we will be disappointed. I do believe that God wants to bless us, but that is not my hope. I don't know when or how God will bless me, so if my hope is in the blessing— I will be disappointed when God doesn't fulfill my expectations. My hope is in the fact that anything I lack in this life 
is grace stored up for me in the life to come. And it's better to lack here because God will right every wrong and fulfill every shortfall if my faith endures to the end. If my hope is in the world, if I am using the promises of God as my foundation, I will not be satisfied. Even so, God's promises are not for us to bind God, but for God to teach us to trust him. When my hope is in heaven and in the coming revelation of Jesus Christ, I will be drawn into the holiness of God. My focus is on him and reaching the finish line. Those who hope in the world will hope in his delay and neglect their call to holiness. All of that was written by Eddie Snipes, and thank you, Eddie. Second, in Exodus 29.36, we have a wonderful illustration of holiness as we find the Lord giving instruction regarding the altar of sacrifice. In this passage, there are two actions specified. The first is a cleansing, which comes from the blood. That is, the altar was made clean, or if you would, righteous, by the blood of atonement. Next, the Lord says to anoint it in order to make it holy. Recall that anointing is done with oil and is always a picture of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Here we see then an important lesson. Righteous standing is the result of the blood, while holiness is due to the anointing of the oil, or the Spirit of God. Upon receiving salvation, accepting the atonement of Christ's indescribably precious blood shed on Calvary, we are covered by His righteousness. And because we receive at the same time the indwelling of His Spirit, we are made holy. That's why the Bible calls those who are saved saints or holy. Those are the same words in the original languages for both. Paul put it this way, God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Upon being saved, we are sanctified or made holy by the Spirit, taking up residence in our hearts. And as a consequence, our conduct or manner of life is to become holy. The outworking of the Spirit's influence in our lives should be more and more evident. Thirdly, Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I beseech you, brothers, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Paul picks up on the illustration of the altar of sacrifice and tells us, present your bodies a living sacrifice, one that is holy and clearly different from the deathly avarice of the world. Yes, This living sacrifice is holy, and it has nothing, nada, to do with soberness, monasticism, or some sort of self-flagellation. As with salvation, personal holiness is a responsive choice on our part. God initiates, and we get to participate, but fundamentally, it is always Him at work in us by His Spirit. So, The question becomes, how deep are you going to go? Just how much control are you really giving him? Not just with the biggies, so to speak, like, should I take that new job or help me get through this trial? But will you surrender each thought, word, and deed? Now, fourthly, go ahead, read Ezekiel 47, 1 through 12. I'll give you a second. There, we're done. Most scholars consider this passage as pertaining to the millennial period. Yet, among other things, it speaks of the sanctifying work of God's Spirit. This mighty, life-giving river is a miracle in and of itself. It starts as a small rivulet 
flowing from the south of the altar of sacrifice and without any tributaries, becomes a deep, uncrossable river. Miraculous. The altar points to the shed blood of Christ and thus his gift of salvation. Righteous standing before God. But the stream, the flowing water, literally living waters, speaks of the Holy Spirit. It's a small rivulet to start with and typifies the deposit of God's Spirit made in our hearts upon salvation. But Ezekiel is led down this rivulet's path a thousand cubits and is escorted across it. Well, it's larger now, deeper. The water comes up to his ankles. Hmm. In like manner, when we follow the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, we are led to walk the talk, if you would, ankle deep, so to speak. The Holy Spirit begins to change us, and our walk is refreshed in His living waters. Next, the prophet is led another thousand cubits further downstream, and again crosses it. Here, it's knee-deep, which speaks of humble worship and prayer. So you go to your knees. As we grow in the Lord, sincere worship and communication with Him become increasingly refreshing, cleansing, and spirit-led activities. Now, After this, Ezekiel has brought another thousand cubits, and again across the river, which is now up to his waist. The midsection of the body was always considered by the ancients as the seat of the soul, the inner man. As such, this pictures the disciple's life as progressing with the Lord to the point where he or she is surrendering the thoughts and intents of the heart to the Holy Spirit. As David prayed in Psalms 19.14, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. Finally, he's brought another thousand cubits, and being led into the river, he finds it uncrossable over his head. Here, he is purely in the flow, if you would, submerged. His guide brings him back to shore where he now finds the banks filled with fruit-bearing trees. The river heals and brings life wherever it flows. At some point, full surrender, absolute immersion in the living waters is going to happen in the life of every true disciple of Christ. Maybe here in this life, but absolutely in heaven. The living water gets deeper and deeper to the point where its current is uncrossable, and that is the point at which we see its life-giving force. Partaking of God's holiness gets to be more and more a current, if you would, in the life of the sincere follower of the Son of Man. Every action, every word, every thought fully submitted to its flow is life-giving and healing. You don't cross it anymore. You can only go with it. Yes, it's a chase. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you. You shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, having these promises, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and, and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Perfecting holiness literally means to finish it, to complete it. But notice the let us. In other words, it's voluntary. It's a matter of how deep and far you will go in the river. In conclusion, what does this holiness look like anyway? Well, the Bible uses just one word to describe the indescribable. We roughly translate it beautiful. See Psalms 29.2 and 96.9. It can also mean, though, pleasant, lovely, or delightful. What you may never have considered is that our holy, holy, holy God is thus indescribably beautiful, pleasant, lovely, delightful. Absolutely nothing compares, not even approaches. His holiness is a beauty that fills eternity with awe that makes the highest, sinless angels blush. He makes life, life. As we draw near to him, this holiness is measured unto us. 
and the result is just beautiful. So, in conclusion, you see, when I first met my dear wife, the work of God's Spirit is what I saw, and I knew it immediately. Likewise, with holiness, when you see it in someone's life, you know it, and there's nothing more beautiful. Now may the Lord grant you peace in the midst of any storm and faith to trust Him. Look for our next podcast, and may you, my friend, realize more of His grace today.